There are two elements really to this paper, two things I want to get across, one of which being that you know, half of it kind of takes the view of the state that we've, we've come to see is, is the, um, the oppressor or whatever else. And the other half is a bit more optimistic in terms of how we might be able to work within that. I mean, uh, I don't want to reduce the state to this kind of unitary force that has one vision. Uh, and then that, that is what is carried forward. So as a kind of a starter, um, I'll, I'll begin with that. Um, it would help if I can actually get the thing started. Which one? Oh, right. F5. F5. Thank you very much. Okay. That's it. Uh, it's not my thing. Um, okay, so I'm just going to uh, begin here. And because the devil's in the details, some of this stuff I want to make sure I don't miss out. Um, so today I'll be discussing the rapid transformation occurring in the asylum service sector uh, within the United Kingdom, particularly. But as we've, we heard yesterday, and, and, and you can see in the news, uh, this is happening all over the world. Um, uh, it's, it's happening in Cyprus and in the, in the removal centers here. Um, um, so primarily these developments that have led to the privatization and securitization of this provision uh, over the course of the last year. It's, fair, it's fairly recent. Okay? Uh, the implications of which are widespread and do not necessarily end with the well-being of asylum seekers, though that is the focus of this. Uh, but they may eventually impact the whole of, of society. Um, and I'll kind of maybe hopefully get to what I mean by that, uh, the implications of basically of these private organizations, these private security firms expanding into other realms. I mean, we, there's amongst some activists uh, in this area, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of general perception that G4S and Serco and Reliance, these major security firms, are seeing the asylum housing market as a way to get into the housing market more generally, social housing, whatever else. These are kind of implications I'm suggesting, but there's, at the moment, I can't put my finger on, on <coughs> these things quite yet, but it's something to think about. Um, the acquisition of the Home Office asylum housing contracts by G4S, Serco, and Reliance can be said to be an intensification of the surveillance uh, society in which state control over populations, particularly vulnerable and marginalized groups, becomes the ultimate expression of a state of exception um, where due process and the rule of law are conspicuously absent. However, despite the increased uh, isolation and criminalization of asylum seekers, which are arguably the results of extending the logic of detention to the asylum housing sector, the possibility of resistance to these paradigms still exists. As I will attempt to emphasize throughout the paper, we must make an effort to abandon notions of power that accept the indelible supremacy of the sovereign state and instead adopt an understanding of power that is more diffuse. It is a power that is present both above and within society, and in this way we can then conceptualize how a resistance to the expansion uh, and private uh, security forces of private security forces can be stemmed using the very same methods and tools used by the state in administering its deterrence model. And uh, as the Joint Committee for uh, Human Rights uh, referred to UK legislation on asylum seekers in 2007, uh, it's deliberate policy of destitution. Okay? So I'll start with a little bit of a background as to where we are to, to March of this last year, or this year actually. Um, and if it gets a bit kind of bogged down by this, uh, I might skip some of this history. But just to kind of give you an, an idea as to what, what the housing situation in Britain was um, up to March. Uh, so under the 1999 Immigration uh, Asylum Act, Immigration and Asylum Act, destitute asylum seekers who could not reside with friends or family or find any form of accommodation could apply for housing through the National Asylum Support Service. As we heard, it no longer exists in that form. It's just kind of now uh, dispersed amongst the UK Border Agency. Uh, it was a section of, of, of uh, the Home Office, right? Um, and so the 99 Act centralized provision for asylum seekers, making the Secretary of State rather than local authorities responsible for the housing of asylum seekers. This was seen as incredibly important for improving the state's surveillance of asylum seekers and was used as a tool for punishing those who failed to abide by the rules laid out for them. For instance, asylum seekers that refused to be dispersed to a city not of uh, their choosing uh, where community and support networks were virtually non-existent, were made ineligible for any form of NAS support, whether it be related to accommodation, living allowance, or otherwise. The ultimate aim of this policy was one of disincentivization, uh, dis uh, made clear by remarks made by then Home Secretary David Blunkett, um, who stated in 2002 that the legislation was intended to, be s to send out a signal around the world that we are not open to abuse. Um, 
Under Section 186 of the Housing Act 1996, local authorities no longer have a duty to house asylum seekers. The 1999 Immigration and Asylum Act brought this provision wholly under the purview of Mass. However, while the power to house destitute asylum seekers was now in the hands of the UK government, there was no infrastructure to support it. So the state had not initiated some kind of grand building project in order to uh, house these asylum seekers. It instead relied upon contracts with regional consortia comprised of local authorities, housing associations, uh, various private accommodation providers, and private landlords, some of which are kind of just examples. I mean, there's, these are loads, but uh, as a kind of example of what you might find in one of these consortia, you might have this Glasgow City Council and the YMCA. <coughs> Um, Safe Haven Yorkshire, a couple private companies, Angel Group, Clear Springs Management Limited, all with their own set of issues, I suppose, uh, which I'll get at uh, in just a moment. Um, of course, so these agreements were initially fixed term, uh, maybe five years, and they were renewed, uh, or not renewed, as the case may be. Uh, and they were, uh, however, as a result of public spending cuts following the, res uh, the economic downturn, many of these consortia dissolved as the government sought cheaper ways to house asylum seekers. Some local authorities voluntarily opted out of these agreements um, upon the uh, end of the contract, uh, seeking to abandon the often costly and relatively unrewarding practice of providing housing services to asylum seekers. In 2010, the Birmingham City Council and uh, the Wolverhampton, uh, Wolverhampton City Council uh, declared that housing priority must be provided for British people in these difficult economic times. Right? A councillor in Birmingham reaffirmed the uh, perception that foreigners took British homes from British people, stating that the city needed all of its accommodation for its own people. We've got that other quote there, too. If you say I'm putting Birmingham people first, then yes, I am. Okay? Very straightforward. Um, in January 2011, the government announced the termination of its contract with the Northeast uh, Contracting Consortium for Asylum Support, um, something that ended up occurring all over the country, and began initiating a series of housing contracts presented under this banner of the uh, long-winded Commercial Operational Managers Procuring Asylum Support Services Project. Okay, this is also could fit it into the acronym of COMPASS, you know. Um, so it is COMPASS for short, okay. Um, the border agency's decision to cut costs on asylum seeker support were born out of a spending review in October of 2010 and resulted in the agency's aim to save about 500 million pounds by streamlining the support process. The impact on individual asylum seekers and families was huge, with many facing immediate evictions, the fear of homelessness, and uh, almost certain destitution in all cases. In November of uh, 2010, 600 asylum seekers in Glasgow faced eviction from their local authority accommodation. Voluntary services such as Y People, were, uh, which is kind of attached to YMCA, and one might say the former YMCA, I guess, were left scrambling to take up the slack. Today, as contracts have been secured between the government, Reliance, G4S, and Serco, those formerly living in an accommodation provided by organizations like Y People, once again face this prospect of homelessness and destitution. Their fears of living under constant surveillance of companies that many asylum seekers associate with the coercive tactics of the UK border agency are arguably well grounded and very real. Okay, so here's the question that's kind of on, on the tongue. So so what, right? So everything is being privatized everywhere. You know, so what what are the implications of, of, of this particular move? Um, well, to begin to answer these questions, we must look at the nature of the companies that have been contracted out to provide these services. Right? G4S is the largest private security organization in the world. It hires 625,000 people globally. It's the second largest private employer. I think it's behind Walmart. Um, it boasts its annual turnover of about 7.5 billion pounds. Um, if we look at uh, Serco, G4S, Reliance, they have contracts to operate removal centers, even prisons uh, within the UK. Elsewhere, they're also responsible for the trans, oftentimes the transportation centers, uh, transportation services of asylum seekers towards their deportation, uh, to and from these uh, detention centers, uh, from, upon point of entry. So, when the Home Office ended its asylum housing contracts with local authorities in 2011, these firms became the preferred bidders in a series of bidding wars in which the UK government ostensibly sought a low-cost alternative to its current housing agreements. In a meeting which I attended. Uh, between G4S, the UKBA, and a handful of academics from the north of England, uh, Stephen Small, the managing director of what I think is a curiously titled Care and Justice Services Department of G4S, 
declared that the company was in the business of making money and viewed the latest deal with the Home Office as a natural expansion into the, quote, asylum market, end quote. Um, this is perhaps a benign statement on its own until one considers who the service users of the asylum housing sector actually are. By law, asylum seekers have no tenancy rights to speak of, and G4S does not receive its earnings from individual asylum seekers but the state, so it seems reasonable to conclude that its obligations are instead to the Home Office. You know. um, so in addition, all three companies and their subcontractors have racked up an extensive list of human rights abuse claims. Um, we've probably, very many of us are very familiar with these. Um, I won't go, them, go into them in terrible detail, but some of the more recent events included death of Jimmy Mbenga, an Angolan asylum seeker who died whilst in G4S custody on board a flight out of Heathrow Airport. Witness accounts suggest that Mbinga struggled for his breath while being handled by G4S staff, though the Crown Prosecution Service decided against bringing charges against the guards, citing insufficient evidence. Um, previously, a G4S whistleblower claimed the company's officers were inadequately trained and engaged in illegal restraint practices during a deportation flight to Kabul in 2004. In 2010, G4S received 773 grievances regarding conditions in its removal centers. Uh, and complaints of substandard patient care have been leveled at medical staff managed by Circo, working at Yarl's Wood uh, Detention Center. Okay, um, and then we have a reliance example. Uh, an asylum seeker is similar to the G4S situation that's sustaining injuries while in, in reliance custody. Um, a, a medical doctor's report on the treatment of two asylum seekers he, he looked after in July of this year said their injuries include pain and difficulty swallowing due to neck compression, nerve damage at the wrist from excessive tightening of, uh, of or contraction on handcuffs and facial bruising. It is particularly worrying when people's breathing is interfered with. Uh, postural asphyxia and airways obstruction can be lethal. Well, I think that perhaps uh, Jimmy Mavinga may have been, uh, may have witnessed that for firsthand and suffered the ultimate consequence, I, I suppose, but uh, not according to the uh, Crown Prosecution Service. So the, the other issue I want to bring up is, 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 is this, um, are, are these private organizations, these private security firms, uh, the other invisible hand of the state, right? Okay, so state, uh, the controls placed upon asylum seekers and the technologies of power employed to restrict their movements and limit their access to public services seem at a glance to represent the designs of an implacable state intransigent in its desire to subjugate those undeserving um, of its resources and, and recognition. Um, Perhaps we can understand this, uh, sorry, in terms of uh, in terms of this quote by by this by, by a Zimbabwean asylum seeker who, who proclaimed upon hearing that the chief rest was going to be housing asylum seekers in, in the north uh, northeast of England. He said, "I do not want to have a prison guard as my landlord." Um, and so you can kind of see the, the image that's, that's being that, that is obviously in the minds of, of many asylum seekers. Uh, the, the quote evokes questions regarding the nature of the relationship between the Home Office and these private firms. When I asked representatives from both G4S and the UKBA what their responses would be to those asylum seekers who view G4S as an arm of the UK border agency and therefore fear being monitored and housed by the firm, parties on both sides emphatically deny the suggestion that G4S carried out any of the UKBA's duties. Um, it was a puzzling response considering the nature of their contractual agreements. If G4S officers are responsible for escorting deportees on their flights out of the country, managing detention centers, and acting as prison guards at these locations, one wonders what each entity considers its relationship to the other to be. 